Man, it is so good to be able to have back in the house today, Shaleen Bryant. Come on, put your hands together for Shaleen. Best-selling author, tech talk speaker, Hollywood producer. Honestly, just one of our very favorite people on the planet. Shaleen uh, lives out on the West Coast, but uh, I gotta tell you, she's a great champion of the school. Every time I turn around, I meet one more person who tells me they've met Shaleen and she's talked so highly, not just of our university, but honestly, of our university students. And so uh, it is just a whole lot of fun to have her back. Her brand new book just came out yesterday. Uh, she's going to do something pretty awesome and fun for us this afternoon that she'll tell us about uh, for a book signing, but Ridiculous Faith has just come out. We're going to be a big supporter of that. Uh, in way of introduction, uh, we also have a little video from the great Francis Chan. Let's watch this, and then Shalene will come out and bring God's Word to us. Excuse me? Yes? We're going to skip it today. Okay. because whenever I see Francis in that PSA, um, he always asks me, do you even love the people you're about to speak to, Shaleen? And I can totally tell you guys that I love you! Um, it's so great, I mean, this is like family to me coming back here. I brought pretty much West Coast right here, my family. You know I love you when I bring my family from LA. Amazing, and last time I had my son Blake here, he ended up at Pepperdine. I know, Malibu, the beach kind of got him. But my daughter, Brookie, she committed to play lacrosse. Can I see the lacrosse girls today? Woo! Next year she'll be here, and I am like so excited. So you'll be seeing a lot more of me, and I just love this campus, and I love the students. But most importantly, I love your hearts. You know, some of you know I created skip1.org because I had never skipped anything in my life. Food, facials, fashion, I ate it, I bought it. And I started sponsoring a couple kids for my children. Some of you might have heard this story. And their pictures are on the refrigerator. And we pay the 25 bucks a month. I think there's a slide for it. And one night I had a party, and my friend brought a woman, and she goes, you fell for that? How do you know those kids aren't 40? And I'm like, what's your name? Can you get out of my house? No. Um, really, I said, I don't. I'm just thinking that these kids are real. And I got a little girl for our daughter, Brooke, and a little boy for our son, Blake. And she goes, well, I never really fall for that. So that night I go to bed and I go, Bryce, honey, I'm going to Africa. I want to see where our 25 bucks a month's going. And he goes, cool, let's spend $3,000 so you can find out. I go, I'm serious. What if it's fake? So I flew, you guys to a little village in Gaba like I was Diane Sawyer, and I was going to bust this thing open if it was fake. And I show up with the photos after being in coach for 24 hours. Anyone film me? And I go, hi, I'm from America, and I came to meet my two kids, AR212 and GR479, where are they? <laughs> I was that rude too, by the way. And this gracious woman gets up and she goes, follow me. She hikes me two miles into the back lot of like a movie set. Mud huts the size of my walk-in closet with a bad looking sheet for a front door. She goes, this is Omega's house. And that's a little girl in my refrigerator. She goes, go ahead, go in. And as I pulled that sheet back to go inside, this little girl darts at me. She goes, Mazungu, which means white, okay? But at the time, <laughs> at the time I'm thinking she's saying angel, like this white chick just dropped from the sky. And I didn't recognize her because she'd grown from her photo, but I go, Omega? She goes, yeah, I go, I'm Shalene. She goes, I know. 
And as I was hugging her like I would my little daughter, Brooke, I'm thinking she's real, 25 bucks a month. And then my eye caught our Christmas card photo of our family in her mud wall. I'm like, my mother-in-law doesn't put up my picture. I'm like, wow, like, this is amazing. I'm like, I'll buy you anything because I have an American Express card and I'm a mom. And she gets this big smile on her face and she goes, I want a bed. I'm like, cool, where's Target Jungle out here? Like, <laughs> you got a pottery barn? So I literally came back after this trip, this experience completely changed, completely changed. But there was something I didn't share with you last time I was here. And that was that I had this huge issue with homelessness here in America. She had been traveling the world so much, going to all these different countries and building kitchens through skip1.org so kids could have food and clean water every day, that the greasy chick outside of my Trader Joe's bugged me. But I'm a Christian, so you can't really say that. So I'd like pull up to the light, because they're all over Southern California. Any homeless people in Virginia? Yes. What? Is there? Okay, thank you. I haven't seen one yet, right? So in LA, they're everywhere because the temperature is beautiful. And so I would pull my car up to the light, at like the, you know, Carl's Jr., and I'd have the arm of the door block their face so I wouldn't have to look at them. Because I really had convinced myself, since I was taking care of all these children around the world, that some other person could deal with this homelessness. You got to understand, when I was your age, well actually a little younger in high school, 17, I started my own business out of my bedroom called California Coupons. Anyone get the money mailer or those coupons in the mail? So I started this California Coupons business where I would have advertisers put in like a pizza place and a tanning salon and um, all these, a dry cleaner, and they would pay me to go in my book. And I would mail it to all 20,000 homes in my neighborhood. And I was making like three grand every other month. The problem was I had to share my bedroom. And back then there was only two phone lines that were allowed in the house, there were no cell phones, with my baby sister who's right here in the front row. And so she would not answer the phone correctly during nine to five business hours. She would say, hello. And I'm like, Shanda, answer the phone, California coupons. She's like, no, it's my phone line too. And I said, listen, I'm running a business here. Answer the phone. She goes, I'm not gonna do it. So my mom calls us, she's like, girls, do you see that phone line? It's attached to my house. Quit the arguing or I'm yanking it out of your room. And she goes, oh, and by the way, girls, Shalene, you still have to clean the downstairs of the house, Miss CEO, and your sister, you're responsible to clean the upstairs every weekend. I go, mom, I got it. She goes, it hasn't been happening, and I'm gonna cut that phone line. So the next day, I'm busy doing my business, thinking I'm big time, and I hear my mom downstairs go, Shaleen, get down here. So I run downstairs, and the front door is wide open. She goes, who is this? I go, oh, it's Molly Maids. Ladies, ladies, come on in. I want you to clean the whole downstairs for me, the kitchen, the bathrooms. And my little, my little sister standing at the top of the stairs looking down at me. And she's like, what? And I go, Shanda, do you want Molly Maids to come up and clean upstairs for you? She's like, yeah. I'm like, California coupons, girlfriend. Answer the phone. <laughs> I got my first employee, right? <laughs> So when I say I had a judgment problem, I did. I was like, you're homeless, I will give you a bike, deliver pizzas, do whatever you have to do to make money. But see, the Bible told me in Isaiah 55 that your thoughts, Shalene, are not my thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. See, I think I thought I had it all figured out I also think I was patting myself on the back because I was feeding children and building kitchens. And I'm like, someone else handle, handled this, the, the homeless thing. You know, I realized as I was going through this that there was a huge issue for me. And that was that I was looking at things and I was 100% wrong. See, if Mary, the mother of Jesus, and I had been best friends since kindergarten, and we hung out together, and we had BFF bracelets, and she came back from Aunt Elizabeth's house, pregnant, all barent chick of barent barent, and tried to tell me, her best friend, that she, that the Holy Spirit came upon her, and that she was carrying the Savior of the world, I'd be like, Mary, seriously? I'm your best friend. What did he look like? I know Aunt Elizabeth. Who is he? She'd be like, no, Shalene, I promise. And I'd be like, I'm done with you. 
we are never going to be friends again. And I would have been dead wrong. You know, if Noah's wife, yeah, Noah's wife and I were friends, Naomi, I think's her name, and he's building this ark, and her and I did carpool together with our little kids, or camel pole, or whatever it was, <laughs> and they're building this ark, I would have been, your husband's whacked. Come get a biblical separation. You can live with me and my husband. We'll take care of you. And I would have been dead wrong. And this is what I love about Peter. In Mark 8, Jesus was predicting his death to the 12 disciples. He's like, this is what's going to go down. And Peter pulls Jesus aside and he said, no way. I'm not going to let that happen. And Jesus looks at Peter and goes, Satan, get behind me. You look at things from a human perspective, not from God's. So is it possible, you guys, that because we're humans, we look at things from a human perspective? My first go-to isn't like, let me look at it from God's perspective. I'm like, no, she's pregnant, she had sex. He's building an ark, he must be on drugs, okay? I mean, this is my thoughts. They're going to they're gonna crucify Jesus. I just saw him make these miracles. Not on my watch. I got your back, Jesus. Come on, guards. That's what we do. And we're dead wrong. When it came to this homeless thing, I was looking at it from a human perspective. And I was dead wrong. You know, there's a verse in the Bible. It's in Matthew 25, and it says, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. And every time I would open my Bible app or anything that had to do with the Bible or a verse of the day, that verse would be on it. And the word that would keep coming to my head is homelessness. I'm like, who are the least of these in America? It's like the homeless or people just out of prison, probably. I don't know. And Francis Chan's handling that, so let him do that. So I'm thinking, it's the homelessness. So I'm like, look, God. I literally screamed it in the car one day. I go, if you want me to do something with this homeless thing, then you're going to just have to drop it into my lap because it's not out of the overflow of my heart. It's not in my joy. And isn't that true? Sometimes obedience is not in our joy. But yet when we obey, things go our way. And so that week, within five working days, Monday through Friday, I'm at an event, I'm opening for Seth Godin, and he says something, he goes, when was the last time you did something for the first time? And the homeless word pops in my head. The next day, another speaker is honoring the Skip One charity and this other charity called Invisible People. I'm like, oh, is that like Invisible Children where you go help rescue people? And the guy, Mark Horvath, goes, no, I'm, I'm helping with homelessness. I'm sitting at his table. And he goes, you know, 30% of the homeless people out there, yeah, they probably are on drugs or messed up. But there's this percentage of them in the shelters that I work with, these children, and with that one word, I'm like, what? There's homeless children? He goes, yeah, in the homeless shelter that I work in, you have to be drug tested, you're in there for 90 days, and it's trying to give people a second chance. He goes, what's crazy is there's 11,000 homeless people in Los Angeles, and there's 5,500 churches. He goes, if every church just took two homeless people, like the whole congregation church, we'd have no homeless problem. I'm like, whoa. So the next day happened to be our monthly Skip One board meeting. And I said, hey, I have this idea to our team. What if we did an event called Skip for the Homeless this holiday? And we packed these glove bags. Because Mark had told me homeless people, they love getting socks. Think about it, they're homeless. They can't do their laundry, they can't change their socks. They love socks. So what if we made these bags, and I call them G-Love, G-Love, because it fits in the glove box of your car. It's one of these. What if we made these cute little glove bags, this kind of little backpack, and it had the socks, and then the next time I see a homeless chick, or guy, the greasy chick out of Trader Joe's, that's why I always say her, her name's Tina now, but I, I, can, hand, I, can, hand, <laughs> I can hand them a glove bag and find out their story. So my board is like, this is amazing, let's do it. So we have this big event, 300 people show up, we pack hundreds of bags, and then Mark Horvath gets up on stage and says, 
these bags actually aren't for Skip One to pass out. They're for you to take home and put in your cars and have a positive interaction with a homeless person. And everyone's like, oh, they look just like me. I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> and so everyone took a bag, and we're driving home, and we get back into our neighborhood. And this is in 2010. My daughter, Brooke, she rolls down the back window. She hangs her body out. She's like, mom, I see one. I see one, mom. And she hucks it out the window to the car. Good catch, by the way. No, that's for you. You have to have a positive interaction with a homeless person now. And so, <laughs> right? And I'm like feeling so fantastic, you guys. And I get home and I'm telling my husband, wasn't that amazing? I like totally got 300 people uncomfortable about homelessness. And we made these cool bags. And my husband goes, really, Shalene? Seriously? You think you slowed your car down to five miles an hour so our daughter could whip a bag out at someone that you're helping homelessness? I go, what, Bryce? That's amazing what we just did. He goes, he goes, really, do you think that's it? That's your best? So that night I go to bed, and I was thinking of what Mark Horvath said. You know, if, if we're a follower of Jesus Christ, we are the church. I don't need a building or the best speaker or the best. I'm the church, right? You want to go to my church? I'm the church. And I'm thinking, what if I took just one homeless person, just one, and I gave them the leg up of a lifetime? Like I just opened up my Rolodex of connections. Like I knew a friend who owned an apartment building in Van Nuys, California. I have girlfriends who change their furniture every time Pottery Barn gets a new spring catalog. I, I, had, I knew people. So I call Mark and I go, Mark, I have an apartment at $600 a month. Skip one, I'll turn on the lights, the water, the first month's rent, security, but you have someone who can maybe handle that. And he goes, I do. Her name is R.D. I go, her name's Road? He goes, no, big R, little D, R.D. And I go, great, well, the apartment will be ready February 1st, 2010, because we just had that event in December. He goes, great. So I had my friends backing up their U-Hauls. I mean, there was enough toilet paper in this apartment for like five years, right? I mean, it was, it was packed out. And the day came when Artie showed up and the van pulled up. She hops out. She's this little thing. She's waving her hands in the air, super excited. I hand her her key to apartment two. And as we're walking down the corridor, she goes, wow, I haven't seen one of those before. And I'm like, oh, a swimming pool? I go, I know, your, your apartment's on the first floor. You have a view of the swimming pool. She goes, no, actually, I was talking about a mailbox as we were passing this bank of aluminum mailboxes. And she saw her name on apartment two. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I've never seen someone excited about a mailbox in my life. But it all made sense, right? I mean, this was giving her her dignity back. She didn't have a place to call home or get mail. And so she opened up that apartment and she went inside. And I want to show you her reaction. Can we play that video? I wish I could have brought her here. She's afraid to get on a plane. I got to give a big shout out to our favorite evangelist, Mr. Chris Brogan. He's always talking about skip1.org and he's always talking about invisiblepeople.tv. Well, we connected and today they're making glove bags to hand out to homeless people. It's not really for homeless people. It's for all these people to have a positive interaction with a homeless person. I got to bring out my daughter today for Skip One, supporting InvisiblePeople.tv. We just packed 300 bags and it was awesome. Well, that was a perfect way to bring in the holidays. Skip One, Mark Horvath just hit it out of the park about homelessness. We packed over 300 glove bags and I'm thinking bigger next year. I don't know, we knocked that out in about 20 minutes. These people were serious. So thank you for skipping, thank you for coming out. And for those of you watching on the live stream, thank you for being a part of this awesome event. Next year, make plans to be here. This 
is an exciting day for our team. Uh, remember our 1212 event last year where we skipped for the homeless this holiday and asked you all to send in your beyond the bag stories. Well, today is 2-2 two -two of 2011 and we are getting ready to give RD, one of our homeless friends, the leg up of a lifetime and reveal her new apartment to her that she'll be moving into. To get the thousand dollars of first month's rent yeah. and security probably cost five thousand dollars in bureaucracy. And the hoops that a landlord has to no wonder landlords don't right. want to, you know what I mean? And you said skip it. Yeah, we're just gonna skip it. <laughs> That's what we do at Skip One. We're just going to skip, skip that. It. And it's easier for me. Yeah. Like, you got to skip the bureaucracy. She would be on the street another 18 days, and that's just not. Right. Last night was her last night on the streets, and hopefully with you guys skipping, it'll be her last night forever. So thank you for being a part of our Skip One team. Um, and this is something that it means a lot to some of the homeless friends I've met. They don't have an, an address. And so to be able to receive mail and get a job and get their dignity back, this is a really good day. Thanks for skipping. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. I feel like Jesus is still living in apartment two. It's been six years. RD pays the rent faithfully every month and always on time. See, God once again took me through another experience in my life. And I know he wants to take you on experiences. And some of you experience bad experiences. But experiences with God, no matter what they are, they change us. And people can notice it. You know, Moses had an experience with God. He had just, it had been three months since he led all, he, he led everyone out of Egypt. I mean, across the Red Sea, he had the whole plague thing go down. He stuttered. Aaron had to speak for him. Moses had an experience with God. But once they crossed that Red Sea, and Numbers says it was with over 603,000 people, kind of big congregation, right? He's kind of leading a lot of people, a lot of pressure. Yet God said, I want you to come spend 40 days with me on the mountain. I sometimes don't have 40 minutes to spend with God because I'm so busy. Yet Moses knew it was more important to know who God is than about, it's more important to know God than about God. And at a Christian school, you learn a lot about God. But how much time do you spend knowing God? I love the verse, and I'm jumping around, so sorry for the people running my slides. I kind of do that. I don't know why I even have notes. Exodus 24, when Moses went up on the mountain, the Lord covered, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai for six days. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud. And as he went up the mountain, he stayed there for 40 days and 40 nights. There's something epic about this 40 day, 40 night thing. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. Noah was on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. And I'm trying to find 40 minutes with God in the morning and at night. You know what I mean? It's crazy. And I've been super convicted about this. But in that time that Moses had up there on the mountain, he asked God one of the most bold and gutsiest verses in the entire Bible, in my opinion. Because you, here you are hanging out with God. It says it was almost like a friend talking to a friend. And then he says right here in Exodus 33, 18, it's a super tiny verse. But then Moses said, now show me your glory. I'm like, Moses, did you hit your head? Like, are you kidding me? That would freak me out. But see, it's amazing when we spend time in the presence of God, 
I'm not talking about in convo. I'm talking when you and God spend time alone, what we're willing to ask of him and what he's willing to do for us. See, Moses knew he had a friendship. See, if a stranger walked up and said, hey, can I borrow your car? I'd be like, no. But if one of my friends came up and said, hey, can I borrow your car? I'd be like, here, it's yours. See, it's amazing what happens when we actually spend time with God. Because experiences with God, they change us. What was crazy was, not only did he ask that of God, but God said, listen, in 33, 19, 20, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. But he said, you cannot see my face, because no one can see my face and live. So God agreed to show Moses this one single attribute of himself, his goodness, not his wrath, not his justice, not his holiness, one of the most least threatening, in my opinion, attributes. He goes, I'm going to let you see my goodness, but here's what I'm going to do, and the verse goes on. 33, 21, he goes, then the Lord said, when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and I'm going to let you see a backside glimpse of my goodness. I'm like, what? He shoves him like in a little mini cave, right? And he passes by, and he goes, and when I pass by, you can see my backside of my goodness. And as a former producer, okay, whoa, okay. <laughs> God's glory. No, just kidding. Wow. That sounds amazing in here, right? The timing of that. I'm like, we're having an earthquake. And then I go, we're not in California. No, we're not. <laughs> That's what it sounds like in California, just so you know. The impact that that must have made on Moses alone with God. And as a former filmmaker, I thought, what would that goodness look like? And so I tried to put together a little quick video of what I thought all the millennium, century upon century images that God allowed Moses to see. So take a look at this. What's amazing is what was made, even our earth that we look at every day, was not made out of things that were visible. So I try to picture what Moses saw, the glory of the Lord in his goodness, passed by and left him in awe and wonder of the creator of it all. As I was talking about mountain moments, I decided to email my pastor because I was struggling that I haven't spent 40 days and 40 nights with God. Why should I talk to you guys about it? And so I sent Francis an email saying, is that like literally like 40 days? Like, what do you think? And this email comes back to me instantly, and I'm going to read it to you. You know, usually you get an email pop back like I'm out of vacation, I'm out of the office. This says, your message will be deleted. Sorry, but I'll not be responding to your email. I'm like, what's up, Francis? If there is an emergency, you can tell my assistant Liz at Crazy Love. Otherwise, you can resend this email after March 21st, as in just March 21st. 
I have decided to take a month fasting from anything electronic. That's right, no email, computer, cell phone. I'm going back to the 80s. My mind, <laughs> you're like, what's that? What's the 80s? <laughs> My mind has been so scattered, distracted lately, and it has kept me from being able to have focused and quality prayer times. My relationship with God is the most important thing to me, so I had to do something drastic in order to pray clearly again. I am so excited about this upcoming season of life. It will be nice to look people in the eyes and be 100% focused on them, not checking texts. I am even more excited about the level of peace and joy and confidence I will have because of all the time I will be spending with God. Thanks for understanding, and maybe this will even encourage you to do whatever it takes to deepen your relationship with God. I was like, wow. Here I'm calling to talk to him about the mountain, and he's in this mountain moment right now with God, and I get this email. I'm like, I can't wait to share this with Liberty. This is a crazy email. See, when we actually take the time and discipline ourselves to have a mountain moment, it might not be electronics for you. It might be something else that you're worshiping. But taking a moment with God allows us to see the unseen hand of him at work in our lives and in the lives of people we're doing life with. You know, Bruce and Jamie Watson were a young couple at our church that my husband and I met way back when Cornerstone first started. And to know Bruce, he is a diehard Lakers fan. I know, Los Angeles Lakers. Um, he is. You cut the guy he bleeds purple and gold. I'm not even joking. And he was on a master's scholarship at Master's College, full basketball scholarship, and met his wife Jamie, and they shared the love of basketball. And so they get married, they have their daughter, she's beautiful, and as the years go by, they can't get pregnant again, and they want another child. It's like five years, six years, seven years, nine years, and they're still not getting pregnant. And so our pastor, Francis, at the time was talking about true religion, taking care of widows and orphans. And they go, maybe we should adopt. They like, I don't want to adopt. I want a baby that looks like me. I want a biological child. And she goes, well, maybe we should adopt. So they decide to do an international adoption, and they pick Ethiopia. And they don't even know why they picked Ethiopia. It's like they just threw a dart at the world and said, Addis Ababa. They didn't even know where it was. So they fill out the paperwork, and they get the phone call months later. Mrs. Watson, we have a 24-day-old baby boy that was just left to be found. This is our youngest referral. We'd like to send you a photo of him in your inbox. Let us know if you want to adopt him. His name is Teg. Their daughter, Sabrina, who's now 12, just happens to be homesick from school that day. So they call Bruce at work and say, you got to come home. I have this picture. And he goes, don't open it. Wait till I get there. So he comes home at lunch. They click on the picture, and this little 24-day-old sickly baby boy's picture pops up, and they feel nothing. And they're like, this sucks. And they're staring at the picture, and then Jamie goes, Bruce, scan in, click in, blow up that blanket. And he goes, why? She goes, just do it. So he moves the mouse and clicks on the blanket, and the blanket blows up. And there, all the way on the other side of the world, in Addis Ababa, was a 24-day-old little baby wrapped in a purple and gold Laker blanket. What? With a message just from them, just for them, saying, this is your son, and this is my plan. If that... If this story alone doesn't leave you in awe and wonder of who God is, what he's orchestrating and setting up in your life, I don't know what would. See, my mind goes as a former filmmaker, I'm thinking how 21 years earlier, this unseen hand of God has that little purple and gold blanket land at the dry goods concession stand at the Los Angeles Forum, the home of the LA Lakers. And how that day when that blanket arrived, a young new dad took that little blanket home to Nashville, Tennessee to wrap around his baby in the cold nights. And dog, the dog Duke probably bit holes in it and mom would sew it up until one day she would donate it to the Goodwill. And that that unseen hand would then take that little purple and gold blanket and set it on a rusty shipping container in the port of Corpus Christi, Texas. And it would make its way through the 
around the Horn of Africa, through the Indian Ocean, and port in Somalia. And then it would be loaded onto a truck that would end up driving to a refugee camp and would be handed to a young mom who was in a desperate and dire situation, who was surrounded by daily death. She could barely feed herself, let alone this new 24-day-old baby. And so she wrapped that little baby in this purple and gold blanket with a letter stenciled in English, Lakers, that she couldn't even read because those letters weren't meant for her to read. And they weren't meant for that rescuing officer that drove that baby to the orphanage. And they weren't meant for the photographer at the orphanage that took that little picture. And they weren't meant for that nurse that checked that baby's heartbeat. No, those letters, those letters in English were meant for this young couple on the other side of the world that God knew at this very moment would be crowded around their computer screen, unsettled and undecided on if they should adopt this baby with a clear message that said, this is your son, and this is my plan. See, God right now is orchestrating things that you cannot see, you don't know about, and you haven't even met yet. Because that's the God we serve. See, God also sent a little baby 2,000 years ago, wrapped in a little blanket, with a message just for us. A message that said, this is my son, and this is my plan for your life. Will you follow me? Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can just be in awe and wonder of who you are, that you orchestrate and set up things in spite of us. It's crazy to me how much you love us, your goodness, your mercy, your glory the plans that you know for our life that we don't even need to worry about. Thank you for these students. Thank you that you're setting in motion stories just like this in their life right now. May we trust you. May we fix our eyes on things to come, not on earthly things. Amen. Amen. Can we give it so up I, for Shalane? <laughs>